So we just saw that the atoms of connected graphs, the smallest connected graphs you can build on a set of vertices, are these things called trees. And of course we call them trees because they kind of look like an upside down tree. So you have the root, and you have children coming off of it, and so on and so forth. And the main thing about a tree that we know is that they're connected and that they don't have any cycles in them. So that's kind of nice. That's an interesting thing to say about trees. But we would like to say more things about trees. For example, one thing we might like to say is, well, how big can a tree actually be? They seem kind of scraggly. It doesn't seem like you can add a lot of stuff to them because you add more edges and whoops, you get a cycle. And so there's a very interesting fact on trees that you can prove. And it goes something like this. So every tree on n edges has exactly n plus 1 vertices. In fact, if we look at our tree that we drew just right now, we can see we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 vertices. And so by the theorem, it should have exactly 8 edges. So let's see. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, five, six, seven, eight. It does. In fact, you could draw a simpler tree. You could say, let's draw a tree that looks like this. You have three vertices and two edges. And you could keep trying this. So maybe we should try to prove the statement. And of course, we'll prove it. using induction. So like with all induction proofs, what we'd like to say is, well, what is the induction, the, the PN, the statement we want to make is that a tree on n edges has exactly n plus 1 vertices. All right. So let's see what happens for P1. Well, if we have a tree with one edge, what does it look like? It looks like this. And in fact, it has two vertices. So this is true. So let's assume, as usual, by the induction hypothesis, that that is true for up to n minus 1 edges. OK? So let's consider a tree now that has n edges in it. And let's take one of these edges and remove it. So we have some kind of tree. And again, I'll draw it as my usual kind of hairball. So I have some tree here. I don't know what it looks like. I have some other tree here. I don't know what it looks like. And I have this one edge connecting them. And, and why can I draw it like this? Because I know that there can be no other edge going from one side of the tree to the other because if there had been, I would have had a cycle. I could go all the way here, I could go all the way here and have a cycle. And trees don't have cycles. So if I do have an edge connecting two sides of the tree, those two sides cannot talk to each other. Okay, so let's, let's call this side T1 and let's call this side T2. Okay. Well, first of all, are these two sides trees? Could they be more complicated graphs? Well, no, because removing an edge from a tree cannot create a cycle. So the graph you get does not have a cycle in it. It also has to stay connected because we haven't affected anything inside that subgraph. So T1 and T2 are, in fact, trees. Okay, So we can apply the inductive hypothesis of them. So we can say T1 and T2 are trees. So we don't know how big they are, but they have some number of vertices. So let's say T1 has size has n1 edges in it, and T2 has n2 edges in it. And we know that n is equal to n1 plus n2 plus 1. Okay. Well, so how many... Um, we know that T1 
must have n plus n1 plus 1 vertices okay so because by the inductive hypothesis so t1 has n n1 plus 1 vertices t2 has n2 plus 1 vertices and so the total number of vertices is equal to n1 plus 1 plus n2 plus 1 which is equal to n plus 1 which is exactly what we started to prove and so by induction we're done and so every tree on n edges has exactly n plus 1 vertices okay this is a very important thing and it's important for the following reason suppose every node in a tree had degree 2 okay so suppose we had all nodes of degree 2 in a tree how many edges would that tree have well every node so let's say every node in the tree has degree at least 2 we know that the sum of the degrees is twice the number of edges and so the number of edges is at least 2 times n divided by 2 which is equal to n but that's a contradiction why is it a contradiction because no tree can have a, no tree with n nodes can have more than n minus 1 edges and so there's always at least one node in a tree that has degree 1 so let's draw a tree right so let's draw some so we can draw this let's draw this let's draw this so where are the nodes of degree 1 there's one right here and there's one right here so we say okay fine we'll 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 add something to that node so we don't make it a degree one so now we get this we get this we put something else here and now it's just getting worse we have one of degree one here we have one node degree one here we have one node degree one here so okay let's just remove all that stuff so we go back here and we remove all those things we remove all these things here but we still have one node of degree one we can't escape and these nodes have a special name because I guarantee it exists in a tree not surprisingly they're called leaves so every tree has at least one leaf okay so let's keep that in mind so now we know something interesting about trees right what do we know we know that trees are we know three things about trees they're connected they have no cycles and they have exactly n minus 1 edges for n vertices and the cool thing is and I again I recommend that you play with these things for yourself any two of these properties will imply the third so if you have a if G is connected and has no cycles we just showed that G has n minus 1 edges if G has no cycles and has at least n minus 1 edges it's connected if G has exactly n minus 1 edges and is connected it has no cycles so any two of these three properties implies a third and it's a good exercise to see if you can prove that that gives you some nice warm-up on how to prove things about graphs so that's what a tree has it's got it's connected it has no cycles and it has exactly a mass of edges but what happens if you have a bunch of trees so I have you know my graph consists of this tree this tree and this tree it's not a tree because it's not connected it's a collection of trees 
So I'm guessing you should figure out what this is going to be called. It's called a forest. A forest is a collection of trees. So a graph that is disconnected and each component is a tree is called a forest. All right. So let's move on. Trees are, as we've seen, the smallest kind of connected graphs. And they're important because if we want to connect things up, this is kind of the cheapest way we can do it. So for example, suppose I have a bunch of machines that are connected in networks. So I have one machine here, another machine here, and they all have links between them. So I can put links back and forth. And I want to make sure they can all talk to each other. And I am allowed to relay information from one machine to another. So if I want to get from, from A to B to C to D to E, I don't need to go directly across from A to D. I can go from A to E and then from E to D, and that's okay. But it's expensive to keep the links running. I want to keep as few links as possible. How can I do that? Well, here's where you say, aha. What I'm really saying is that I want the machines to be connected to each other. But I want to keep as few links open as possible. Now, we know that the smallest structure that you can build that is still connected is a tree. And so what I'd like to do is connect the nodes of the graph in some kind of tree structure by using only a few of the edges. So for example, what I could do here is I could say, well, I will enable this edge and maybe this edge and that one and that one. The blue edges give me a tree. So it looks something like this. So I have A, I have E, I have C, I have D, and I have B. This is a tree. There are no cycles and it's connected. It has five nodes. It has four edges, just like it should. And clearly I can get from any of the nodes to any of the others. Now there's an issue of how long it'll take and we're not going to pay attention to that for now. But this tree does span. It connects all the vertices in this graph. And such a tree is called a spanning tree. Okay. So when you have a tree that can span all the vertices of a graph, that can connect them all up by taking some subset of the edges, it's called a spanning tree. And how might we compute such a spanning tree? In fact, we just saw this earlier when we saw how to make a tree from a connected, arbitrary connected graph. We just find a cycle, remove an edge. Find a cycle, remove an edge, and keep doing this as long as we don't have a tree. And that's, when, for, that's how you can make a spanning tree from a graph. So the spanning tree algorithm would look something like this. So given G, find a cycle, remove one edge, repeat until no more cycles. Now we know that as long as G is connected, this will keep the graph connected up to the point that now we now have a tree and that's going to be our answer. All right. So we've seen trees, we've seen spanning trees. There's one particularly interesting kind of uh, tree which is called a binary tree. So what is a binary tree? It's a tree where every node has two children. Every node has two things going on. So this is a binary tree. So we have this. We have two things going out. We have two things going out. Maybe this is nothing else going out. Maybe it has one thing going out. It doesn't have three. This is not a binary tree. Because it has three things coming out of them. Binary trees are very, very important. I mean, uh, for many problems, you can convert the, the tree you're dealing with into a binary tree. And one very easy case where binary trees come up is in evaluating expressions. So I have an operator. Let's say I want to evaluate the expression 2 plus 3, the whole thing, times 5. When you actually parse such an expression, what you can represent this is as a binary tree. At the top of the tree, you have the multiplication. And the idea is that the multiplication will take its two children and multiply them together. Well, one of them is 5, but the other one is the addition of two things, which again is a binary operator. So you can do it like this. So you can represent any arithmetic expression by a, 
a tree like this, a binary tree. And now it's easy to evaluate it. You just go from the bottom up. You say, okay, 2 plus 3 is 5, and then you go up there. So this becomes x, 5, 5, which becomes 25. So binary trees are a special kind of tree that's very important, and we won't spend too much time dealing with binary trees, but um, there are some things that is good to know about them. So first of all, a complete binary tree is one where all the nodes except the leaves have two children. So here's what a complete binary tree might look like. You have one thing coming out, you have two things coming out, you have two things coming out here, and you have two things coming out here. So all the nodes except the leaves, so the leaves are here, they have only a degree one, everything else is degree exactly two. It's a complete binary tree because I can't add any more edges, just like a complete graph. I can't add any more edges to this or anymore without um, causing problems. And uh, a nice fun fact about a binary tree is that if you have n nodes in the tree, so let's say this has n nodes in it, the number of leaves is always n minus 1 divided by 2. Not surprisingly, this comes from the fact that the number of nodes in a complete binary tree, if it has if it has height h, so the height here is the number of steps you go down, a binary tree with height h has 1 plus 2 plus up to 2 to the h minus 1, which is equal to 2 to the h minus 1 nodes. <coughs> and that's all we have to say about binary trees for now.